The following is an ECC Studios production in association with Mark 16 Media. Good evening again and welcome to everyone. We are here again for the God Stop, where we stop and wait on God to take us wherever He wants us to go. I am Pastor Jason Reed. And I'm Trishasta Jeffrey. As students, we need to be prepared when we go to take exams. If you want to take a catalog exam, you would need to be prepared with pens, pencils, erasers, calculators, etc. But those students do not only need to be prepared physically, they need to have the mental preparation as well. They need to have the knowledge of the formulas or anything that they would need to, 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 to mentally be able to do the exam. As Christians, it's the same thing. We can't only be prepared mentally. We have to be prepared in other ways. So this week, we're going to talk about how to arm ourselves as Christians and how to make sure that we're prepared against anything the devil throws at us. But before we get started, we'll meet our guest for this week. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. How are you guys? Good. 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 <laughs> okay, very good. So if you guys could introduce yourself. I'm going to start with Kimberly. If you could introduce yourself and say one thing about yourself. Something exciting. Nothing boring. Give us something exciting. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kimberly Fort. Mm -hmm. And I go to the most exciting church I can think of. Oh, you of. do? Uh, oh, okay. But it sounds like I'm there in this church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And I love the Lord. I like dealing and interacting with young people. And it's a beautiful thing being able to be in his service. Okay, very good. Wow. Exciting. Um, my name is Dominic Merritt. Um, I attend the New Life Seventh day Adventist Church. And um, one thing about me that I guess a lot of people will not know was that I was kind of recently baptized, just about 12 years ago. And at that point in my life, I, well, I was in between trying to decide if to really follow God or not. But I am glad when I look back at it, and I realize that 12 is a very significant number. Mm. Okay, wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Good night. My okay. name is Lisa Tharn. I go to the East Point Sound Adventist Church. And one thing about me is that I love music. Gospel okay. is my favorite genre. Right. Okay, so you sing or you play? Yes, I you do? sing. Oh, so we can ask you to sing before the program closes? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, nice. Uh, well, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and then we're going to have our prayer and we'll get into our lesson for this evening.
Welcome back. Again, we want to say welcome to those of you live on the web, those of you who are following us on Twitter, Facebook. Remember, even on Skype as well, you can call us on Skype. You can send your comments on Facebook. We will read as many comments as we can, answer as many questions as we can. So feel free to weigh in on the conversation. This is not our conversation here on the set, but it's a conversation to all of those of you who are out there via the Internet as well. So before we start our program, let's bow our heads for prayer. God, thank you so much for bringing us through another week and bringing us to the cusp of another Sabbath day. Thank you for allowing us to be able to use our gifts and talents to come and be a witness for you and spread the gospel around the world. Bless the program this evening, Lord, and let everything that is said be done to your names, honor and glory. We love you. Amen. 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 So this week we are discussing arming ourselves for victory. And as was said before the break, whenever we go to do anything, we need to make sure that we're, best, we're fully prepared. So this week we're talking about not just being prepared in terms of worldly life or secular life. We're speaking about being prepared spiritually and what that means for a Christian and what our armor needs to be. So we're going to be reading right now Ephesians 6.13. If I could have one of the guests read that for me. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Mm -hmm. So, the text says that we need to take on the whole armor of God, which means that there are more than one piece of armor that we should use. And it also is talking to us, I think, not only as a group of Christians, as a body of Christians, but also as individual Christians. So, my first question is, what does it mean for each of us, why is it important for each of us to be armed individually? Well, in my opinion, from reading the lesson study, um, there's a, a, quote, a quotation that Ellen G. Wright wrote, Christ Object Lessons, which was basically saying, you know, each Christian is supposed to arm themselves, you know, because this is a, this is a combat, hand-to-hand -hand kind of um, um, fight that's going on. Yes, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we, at the end of the day, we have to make our own calling and our election sure. Our salvation is an individual salvation, and the fight itself is individual. So every man is for himself. You know, um, say for instance, if you have a temptation, say to to um, to steal. No, say for instance, Pastor Reed cannot come and and ask God for forgiveness for that sin because that is not his sin. It is an individual thing where the devil has been attacking us as individuals in our various weaknesses and, and in the areas that he knows that he can get us. And now we have to respond to that attack. Okay, wonderful. Next person. Yes, I have to agree with Dominic in that our temptations are individual and that because of, because of the fact that our temptations are individual, we have our own battles to, to bear in a way. Mm -hmm. We have, so for instance, if, for instance, mine might be stealing or something, I have to work on that with God for myself. Someone else can't work on it for me. That's the battle I have to carry on my own. Okay, so, so before we get to Kimberly, you're telling me we're talking about salvation being a personal thing. But I mean, a group of us, we decide to probably go to a church or go to a crusade, we hear the message and I see all my friends giving their hearts to God who wanted to get baptized like Dominique did 12 years ago. So following the group is not, is not good? I mean, it's wrong for me to just follow the group and go ahead and get baptized with the group? Well, if you might be doing it for the right reason, mm -hmm. but each person has to have their own relationship with God for for themselves because as noted before with regards to temptations and other things which we have to bear it's imperative that we are able to go and petition to God for our problems and our sins and we can't expect others to do that for us so although we might go and get baptized with them we have to have our own relationship with God. Okay Kimberly? <coughs> well the whole way I see it is Going back to the verse where it says, Wherefore take on to you. That is individual. It's not saying take on to everybody or everybody take or have it as a group. Yes, we are a collective as a church, but think about it when you go to war. 
and they always used to, when it was reading the lesson, it was actually thinking about, you know, how to have the old time wars where you will have the shields and everything. When you used to watch those pictures, they had to come together as a group. And if you were not prepared, if you did not have your armor on, you could have been killed. So, yes, it is group, but it's very important to have it as an individual as well. I just wanted to add a point. Um, it's like, for instance, <coughs> say that, okay, you are buying plane tickets for a group of people, mm -hmm. you know, and um, everybody's supposed to go on this particular flight. But when, so when the, say, the, the hostess or whoever calls out the names for the persons, they can only call individual names. They can't call this group and just say, just say that there. They have to call the individual names. So everybody has to stand accounted for it. So that is why, yes, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, mm -hmm. we have to look out for each other. But at the end of the day, we still have a war that rages. Okay, I got us. you. I want to jump in or ahead of TJ in this one. In terms, sometimes you get group discounts. <laughs> so what I mean, you get group discounts. So what I'm saying is that you, you need to explain to me probably from experience. Why is it so personal? Why is salvation so personal? Because, I mean, as I said, all my friends are doing it. I feel comfortable. I feel as though others are doing it as well. So I'm good with that. I'm not alone in this thing. So I feel good around my friends. And we're all fighting and struggling together. So by, by experience, how is it personal? Well, what I will say is, I know my first experience where I was baptized, I actually followed my twin sister and my cousin into the water. That's the truth. So this, is, this the question actually speaks to me because it's only then after, it's after you spend any time with the Lord, after you see Him actually working things out in your life for you, not necessarily you're watching it in somebody else's life. You get to see that the decision you made, although it, you would have felt you did it because other people were doing it and it seemed the right thing to do at the time, then you start to actually grow in Christ. So, to answer your question, I would say, even if you have done something and you don't think you were called or that you actually had the Holy Spirit, the whole other persons will talk about it. You don't know how the Holy Spirit may call you. He, that may have been his way to call you. So my thing is just keep growing and getting to know the Lord. Keep doing everything that you have been doing, allowing the Lord to lead and open up your heart to him. He won't let you down. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, kind of piggybacking on that. If somebody could read Ephesians 6, 14 to 17, please. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, cool. So, how this text is talking about how somebody is armed. So we know that the, the first part of the, the, the text that we're looking at says, you know, verse 11 says that we should take on the armor of God. And then Paul goes to explain what we need in, in very intricate detail, I think. And um, there was a pastor, um, a sermon by Pastor James, and he said that David didn't need Saul's armor when he went to fight Goliath because it would have been difficult because he would have had two sets of armor because he was armed spiritually mm -hmm. and he didn't need that physical protection. You know, I think there's a verse in the Bible that says that you can do anything to the body, but you can't take, yeah, it's either verse in the Bible or it's just saying in, in the church. And I think that's very interesting. So what about um, the fact that, you know, my dad could be a pastor or the first elder of the church and, you know, he could be right with God and he could be walking with God well, or I could marry a pastor or marry a first elder or marry somebody who who they don't have to have any specific title, but their lives could be really in tune with God. Um, does that does that have any effect on me? Am I am I am I saved through that? No. Each individual has to make their own calling and election. Sure, you cannot be saved for me. I cannot be saved for Dominic or for Kimberly. Mm. Okay. Well, but how, how then, in terms of, as TJ is mentioning, we read the scriptures about the arm of God. And I'm asking this question, and I will check Facebook and see if anybody would have answered as well. 
How do you really arm yourself with the arm of God? I mean, we are talking about things that we can't see, shield and sword, or, well, some may say you can't see them physically, whatever the case may be. But how do you really arm yourself? As a young person, how do I arm myself? Do I go in and try to purchase these things and walk around with the Bible in my hand as a sword? Do I have some, how do I arm myself so that I can really benefit from the whole concept of this armor? You, you just made a very important point and I just want to, this, to repeat it again. It says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So from that, we can tell then is clearly, it, it cannot be anything that can be bought from a store. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no physical armor to it. The only way I believe that we can arm ourselves with these tools that God has given us is through prayer, through a committed relationship with Christ, and through supplication, through, through you know, just really, really crying out to God and saying, I need your protection, and claiming that. So you're saying, no, as a young person, I believe everyone here, young, including myself, I'm very young, <laughs> as young people, you're saying that young people can be armed with the armor of God? I thought, isn't that for old people? Is that something that old people who have time can do that, who don't really not, don't have interest in TV and, and radio and stuff like that? <laughs> Going back to the illustration that you have with mm -hmm. David and Saul, well, when Saul was going to give David his armor, yeah. I was, that did come to my mind when I was doing the lesson, but I was looking at it along the lines of David did not need as much protection as Saul would have needed. Mm -hmm. And Saul's uniform catered for us all. Mm. David would not need a uniform to cater for him. Now if playing with us, we have different levels of faith and in terms of growing in Christ, all of us grow in different stages. So you will have persons that want to give you their armor or give you what they figure your armor should be. But it, it weighs you down. I mean like all the different rules and regulations and stuff can weigh you down. So you have to know, you have to, you have to work it out. Like if you, if you look at it, it says, it's an action. You have to put on the armor. Uh -huh. You have to put on the armor. So you're not asking someone to put it on for you or to go in a store and help you choose yeah. which or armor. Like, it is mm. a person, it is, this actually shows you just how personal it is. You have to put on that armor. But it's interesting that she made that point because it's like, what could be a blessing could be a curse at the same time if you use it too soon. Like I remember there was this guy, <coughs> he had a son, and he was saying, you know, there was a time he was in his bathroom and he was shaving, you know, and he realized that his son is so much like him, you know, his son likes to emulate him and everything. And he was just relaying the point that he's scared that one day that his son would someday take up the razor when he's not there and would scrape the skin right off of, right off of his face because he wants so much to be like his father. Mm. And, 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 and the point that comes up from that is that you could have something, but you could just have it too soon and it becomes a curse. So in that, the armor something that people may want to put on you probably is not for you at this point in time because of your relationship with Christ. You are not at that level yet. Well, sorry again, I'm a TJ, sorry, but he said something that piqued my interest. And Lisa, you may want to help me here. Dominic is saying that sometimes you can have things too soon. Is there anything in spirituality that, is too, that comes too soon, Lisa? Well, some person's trials, the trials they, they experience, Mm -hmm. might not force them away from Christianity, but because their faith may not be as strong as someone else's, it may ca cause them to stumble or... So you're talking about the trial, but not necessarily the armor. So the armor cannot come too soon. It can come too late. You like may need no, it, it because you don't... Uh, it's how you are looking at it. So help me, help the, me. The point that it was making was Saul's mm -hmm. armor was different to David. I got your point. I'm talking about Dominique's mm -hmm. point. So oh, the, <laughs> Dominique's point, uh -huh. what he was basically saying is close to what I was saying. Uh -huh. So the two are tight. It's they, just, they are? Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, okay, like in the Bible where it talks about um, you have new Christians. Those newer in the faith, you are okay. supposed to give them milk, not mm -hmm. food. Okay. So it's the same. I, I understand what he's trying to say in oh, that. Okay. Okay. Looking at it in that way, mm -hmm. you gotta start. Like, like when you raising chickens, I think mm -hmm. you gotta start with the, with the you, know, you want with the, the chickens now. Okay. <laughs> I got you. I got you. And then you okay. gotta climb up the ladder. Okay, I understand. True. I I understand what you're saying. It's very true that. I, I, I get what he's saying. That you do? it, no, okay. it doesn't necessarily mean that the faith will come too soon. Okay. But it could be like 
for instance, I, my group of friends, they're Christians, and I, I love being around them and stuff. And sometimes I'm really upset that, you know, there's this one particular friend I have, her faith is so strong, so strong. And I'm like, Lord, how can she face these trials? We're going through the same things academically, sometimes the same things spiritually, and she faces them with such no worrying, no fretting. And I'm like, Lord, why? You know what? But I have to realize her walk with God is different <laughs> from my walk with God. After what I, what I was saying to Pastor Reed is that, um, say for instance, if you're going to witness to somebody, you're going to tell them about who Jesus is, what he's talking about and thing. As you would know, I guess through your experience, you have to go about witnessing in a strategic manner. You just don't shove everything at somebody one time. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at it from that perspective. The fact that how, not saying that they're not important, they're, these values that we hold as Christians are important, but they come at different stages in life mm -hmm. because we learn from them the fact that we can't do without them. Okay. Got you. Are you understand? And as a, I like the quote from the quarter that says, but in spiritual things, no man can make up another's deficiency. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we need to always understand and, and, and think of, even as we go through our Christian experience. And so we may have good friends, good family members who are devout Christians, but we ourselves, we have to be devoted to Christ. We have to be personally connected to Him. If not, it doesn't matter who your friend is, who your family member may be. At the end of the day, we stand before God as individuals. Mm -hmm. We are not saved as group. There is no dis group discount mm -hmm. when it comes to salvation. Mm -hmm. We stand before Christ as individuals. Mm -hmm. It could be scary, but also it, it could is. be a good thing. Because when you look, TJ, you are in school, and you may be placed in a group, and some people in the group don't do any work. Mm. Stress you out, mm. huh? And cause you to get a grade that you didn't really deserve, and mm. you work hard. Mm. Imagine that was happening for heaven, <laughs> and you're put in a group of people who are not caring about salvation, and all you down to hell, and you work so hard. True. Yeah, you feel bad. Isn't it? it would be. Yeah. And I think that it doesn't work that way, though. This, yeah, it's, true. it's nothing that we do that allows us to go to heaven. Yeah. Correct. It's true. God's righteousness. Yeah. It is true. Our is filthy rags, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. and there was a question of the week on Facebook, and the question was, how does someone put on the armor of God? Mm -hmm. And they, we said not theory, we wanted practical. And JT wrote that she puts on her armor first thing in the mornings by having morning worship and devotion. She said it cushions all the darts that she faces during the day. And that goes back to another point that um, I, I saw in the lesson, specifically the, the collegiate quarterly, for those of you who use the CQ. And I was talking about how, because we're all different, we mm -hmm. all face different trials and temptations. So the way that we arm ourselves needs to be different as well. We still have to collectively put on the belt of truth and collectively wear the helmet of salvation. But we also have to make sure that whatever it is that we do is specific to us. Lisa likes music. So maybe a way that she can arm herself against the temptations is by listening to a song or music that gets her it focusing on God and, and brings her back to God. Mm -hmm. You know, if you like to, she if likes you like acting. to write, you like to act, mm -hmm. you can you can Watch go movies. out. Watch movies. Yes, go ahead. You know, you can do something like that. If it is that you like to write, you can write poetry mm -hmm. that can help you when you face those temptations. So don't think that just because we're collective and you don't, you don't the Bible the says way. yeah the yeah. Bible says to arm yourself just like Dominic is saying you don't everybody doesn't arm themselves the same way we have to remember that so if we have to arm ourselves there are like I, I'm pretty sure it's six distinct things that Paul tells us that we need to arm ourselves with so why does he say everything it's can't we just like wear the helmet of salvation I forget about the shield of faith. Yeah, like why, why do you need the shield of faith? What's that about? <laughs> Using the analogy of a soldier. If a soldier goes to war and doesn't have, he has everything but his helmet. And someone Thanks. comes, um, well, let's use David mm -hmm. with a sling mm -hmm. and, a, and a stone. That small stone <laughs> mm -hmm. lit the giant right out. Mm -hmm. Although he probably would have had a helmet, but technically so he didn't have covered. the... Right, he wasn't covered. He took it, yeah, he took it on. <laughs> and and, and um, it, it, it even goes further than that. Let's say, for instance, if, okay, we, you see, that's a, that's a really interesting question because it's like, it can even relate to the Ten Commandments. You can believe, okay, I got nine commandments down pat. I am set and I could stand against the world and I could proclaim that Jesus is Lord. But if I have that one thing that I still hold on to, that I claim that really not that important, then 
I am going to be liable. I am going to have to face that there when Satan comes at me. And he's going to flaunt that in my face. And I think that's one of the big reasons why, if you carry back now to the armor, that is so important to have on all of your armor. Because, you know, the, the lesson talks about the fact that he throws the wells, you know, the wells be done mm. with these different arrows and, and use the whole idea of arrows that are with fire and different things. And it's important that we wear the whole armor to protect ourselves. And, and to look at one aspect of the armor first is we look at the whole idea of wearing all and not just part of it. When Paul starts by stating having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, how does these two relate in terms of truth and righteousness? Paul speaks about loins girt with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. How do these two relate, truth and righteousness? What's the link? Well, for me, um, truth and God is truth. Mm -hmm. God's word is the truth. And righteousness comes from Jesus. So those are the two foundational for, for um, what God is. Mm -hmm. He is truth, and his righteousness covers all. So to me, that is where I find the connection. And I'm happy that Paul mentioned the two. And I'll tell you why. And, and the analogy he uses, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded with truth. And I get from that immediately that truth is something, I mean, you have to stand firm in truth. Don't waver. When you find truth, stick with truth. Don't waver, don't move left, right, stick with it. But when you know brings in the whole concept of righteousness, sometimes we can talk truth. We can talk Bible. We can bring you and, and guide persons into all the rights and the wrongs and the do's and the don'ts. But Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness, which tells me this now talks about righteous living. You can't just... Talk, talk truth. You gotta live truth now. Mm -hmm. The only Jesus that peop that some people will uh -huh. ever see is the Jesus in wonderful, us. Wonderful, wonderful. So if we don't walk up, um, uh, righteously and live the life that God expects us to live, mm -hmm. we might talk all we want, and they still won't believe because our lies and what we're saying are contradicting each other. Correct. So you could loose the word on somebody. I mean, you could <laughs> pelt the word down. You could tell them all Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But then when they see you, your words and action not really making two. You know what I mean? You're not adding up. Yeah. I find it interesting, though, that you use the, the word girdle because it says mm -hmm. in lesson, girdle is like a leather ear prong. Mm -hmm. So it's, I see it like as a belt something that, that wraps around the waist and it protects you in that it shows this is what you stand for, you know, I stand for the truth and that kind of thing. And righteousness being that breastplate, right? Um, I think that you can have truth, as you pointed out, but still don't have the signs of righteousness mm -hmm. and vice versa. Because some people may, may believe that they, have right, that they are righteous, but they just don't have the truth. Mm -hmm. But I believe, as we pointed out a little earlier before, Righteousness that we should have really truly is the righteousness of Christ. Of course. So the link then is the truth of God and his righteousness being done through us. Of course. That is really link is really. Of course. And if I could just jump in. Jump in. <laughs> we was looking at the loins. Mm -hmm. Loins cover your innermost parts, your oh, private okay. parts. Innermost part. So <laughs> mm -hmm. like with truth. Truth cuts deep. When someone really believes in something, if you attack it, it really cuts deep. So we must really defend God's truth because Satan is who is attacking God's truth. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying, not to waver to the left or to the right. If once you know it's truth and it's God's word, stand. Mm -hmm. But as she, uh, this adds to what she said about the breastplate righteousness. People, as people only see some ways your sermon, your lifestyle, and usually the first thing you see, especially from the older times of of a. Of a somebody who's in the army, the first thing you would see is the breastplate, you know, because that, that stands out, you know, that, that people see, okay, well, you probably belong to mm -hmm. that army, so it distinguishes who you stand for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. So, the discussion is going really well. I like it mm -hmm. um, so far. But we're going to take a quick break. But before we do, we're just reminding you to call in on Skype. We are accepting your Skype calls. Thank you again to JT for your comment on Facebook this week. We look forward to more of you commenting. And tweet us, because we're still on Twitter. So find us, facebook.com slash thegodstop, twitter.com slash thegodstop, and <laughs> Skype at thegodstop. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be right back. Don't go anywhere.
From the dust of the ground, God formed man and breathed into him the breath of life. When the Israelites were trapped with their backs to the sea, Moses stretched out his staff and the waters were parted. Samson struck down a thousand oppressors of Israel with the jawbone of a donkey. At the blast of trumpets and a war cry, Joshua watched the walls of Jericho crumble. With torches and empty jars, Gideon and 300 men defeated an army of 100,000. David chose five smooth stones from the stream and with them, he struck down Goliath. 5,000 were fed with only five loaves and two fish. If God can use such small things to change the course of history, certainly he can use you. Welcome back as we are discussing the whole idea of truth and righteousness and some, I, I always say that the greatest want to my mind in the world is balance apart from Christ is balance we can go from one extreme to the other so quickly and to my mind when we focus too much on truth we neglect righteousness when we focus too much on righteousness we neglect truth but it needs to be that balance where, where the truth of God continues to help inform our righteous behavior, which is always empowered by Christ, because there's none good, there's nothing good we can do of ourselves. So I'm saying as we live, as we live, it's important that we live righteous lives. I mean, trust me, people can call your religion all type of things, but when they realize that you're a nice person, a loving person, a caring person, they have respect for you. Because, and that's what I'm saying, to my mind, Christianity is not just a religion. It's just like what Muslims would say, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is what righteousness and truth is. Not something you can recite and win an argument with, mm -hmm. but something that teaches you how to live. Yeah. Yeah. And we, sh we should remember that even if you have all of the aspects, even if you have the whole armor, no matter how well guarded a soldier is, if he falls asleep during battle, he, he doesn't really have a chance. Yeah, yeah. So we need to make sure that as Christians, we, we need to make sure that even though we're armored, that, that, that mm -hmm. point is so important that we have to live it as well. That we can't just say it. So um, I think that there's some tips that we can use to make sure that we use God's armor effectively. We, the first, and all of these are shown through Jesus' life, through Jesus' example. The first one is we need to talk to God through prayer. I mean, we all know that Jesus talked to God constantly through prayer through prayer and that is the only way that we can keep all the aspects of our armor on as well as fight fight the battle against Satan we we should study the word and then lastly we should memorize it because in the when Jesus was tempted in those 40 days the devil came at him and every time every time every time he used scripture to combat the devil so we need to make sure that we remember those as well um, just to kind of add to what Pastor Reese said uh, yeah. I just wanted to say righteousness is the outward working of the inward truth, mm. which is Christ's word, the same word that you were talking about. Yeah. So if we don't do right, but y if if we if we if we don't do the right thing, we therefore neglect what we call truth, mm. and it's as simple as that. Yeah, it's true. So we've spoken about the breastplate of righteousness. We've spoken about the belt of truth, and another part that Paul speaks about is the shoes. Mm -hmm. of peace mm -hmm. of the gospel I'm sorry the shoes of the gospel so in in what sense in what way does the gospel of peace provide us with a good grip in spiritual warfare now I want I want I want you guys to be honest with, with us and be practical because Christianity is not a pie in the sky thing you know what I mean it's, it's, it's about reality you, you follow what I'm saying so this whole idea of peace in the midst of warfare, how does it, as TJ's, I want some practical stuff. 
How does the gospel of peace uh, gives you peace in warfare? They say a soft answer turns away a wrath. Uh huh. So that's one. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Another one. Go ahead. I, uh, um, uh -huh. Being honest, sometimes it's really hard even to tell my friends about grace because it's as if like you're really fighting a battle of trying to not become a lot like them. Mm -hmm. So it's like as if you were trying to tell them, all right, well this is where I start. This is the limit. This is the boundary for me. So. For me, honestly speaking, that is where it is tough. The shoes part. I can I, I understand the righteousness part, the faith, salvation, everything. But it's how I walk. It's how I walk. I have to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. It's how I walk. And the shoes that I walk in. You know, I, to be honest, yes, you, you you have that peace that passes all understanding according to the Bible. In mm -hmm. layman terms, basically, that, basic, that, that, that really says to me, despite the fact that they may curse me, Despite the fact that they may, they may even say, man, look, man, you just can't, carrying this Christianity thing too far. Weird. Despite all of that there, I'm, I am still going to have my connection with Christ because nothing is going to keep me out of heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask at least this one. Because I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure, I, you on, guys on Facebook, just drop me a line. Let me know how you think about this question as well. Peace in war, warfare is dangerous. People die in warfare. People get maimed, dismembered in warfare. Mm -hmm. sure. What peace can one have from the gospel in the midst of all this devastation? Lisa, talk to me. I think knowing that the battle has already been won, mm -hmm. that, is, that is a big part of, of the peace because we know although we are right now we're actually fighting the battle because daily as we live the devil is throwing temptations at, at us and the truth is mm -hmm. he knows our temptations yeah. however we have the upper hand because yeah. we also know our temptations mm -hmm. and we have a god who's working on our behalf yeah. Yeah. but um, i also to you know to add um i think though the peace is not like a peace treaty you know like if you have two countries that are at war and then all of a sudden they decide to, to sign this peace treaty saying, okay, we will not do this here to you and you will not do this to us. I don't think it's like that. I think the peace is like, I, I, well, as she said, you know, know within yourself that the battle is already won. Mm. I think that peace is like saying, despite the fact that my leg just gets shot off, mm -hmm. my arm just get cut off, you know, I just get stoned like Stephen. Mm -hmm. I, I know whom I believed. That's good. I'm, I'm going to come out of that. I'm going to come out of the community. We, we have a comment coming from Skype. Ken from Great Hall. Ken, you take your comment, Ken. Hi, right, good night to Pastor and to you. Good night to you, Ken. Hi. All right. Um, I was looking at the the whole issue of the um the armor and how I remember the question was asked earlier about how do you put on the armor. Now, as we were talking last week, we were discussing how. We have to arm ourselves with the word. Yeah. Um, we only understand how exactly we are to act and behave and to do everything that we're supposed to do with the word. Now, as the comment has been made that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're coming up against principalities and powers, and basically the prince of darkness himself, then our only defense has to be in our mind because that is where, as was discussed before, um, I think it was Dominic at, at the point, the armor of God has to be, I guess it has to be within us, it has to be part of us in that, as it says, the um, we have to gird our minds with the truth, where we know for sure that we are in keeping with God's will, and we can only do that through studying the Word. And then, as we are mobilized by the Gospel, because as I said, the Gospel is that which covers our feet, and our feet is the source of our motion. As we go forward, we will know not to, as I guess, say, go too far, because as we have studied the word and we know exactly what God would have us to do, then we will not overstep the boundaries for which He would have us to. Well, let me ask you a quick question before you go, though, Ken, in terms of how has this concept helped you as a Christian? 
Well, it has helped me immensely because as we go through every day, there are different things that will come up. But um, as we face these different challenges, like for me, I also am a big fan of music, and a lot of the time, a song will pop into my head, you know, as in, I think it's a bad friend that said that we have to keep a song in our heart. Yeah, keep a song in your heart. Mm -hmm. And God would then use the song that is within you to remind you of something that you would need at that particular moment, so which true. can then help you to go through. Yeah. Okay, so wonderful. True. Thank you so much for your comment, Ken. And, Thanks, Ken. And call again sometime. Right. Yeah, no. Wonderful. Good, so we were talking about that and like what Ken said and uh, uh, what I'm trying to draw from you guys. Because sometimes people think that we're fake, uh -huh. we're crazy or something, we don't really believe what we are saying. Because Christians do go through some hard things. But uh, all, I'm, all I'm trying to get from, from you is an understanding, even in your experience, how has this gospel, and, and like what Lisa said, in terms of knowing the outcome, how has this really helped us personally? To have that peace when things get tough and rough. When you're about to fail, well, that's not you. I can't even use that <laughs> analogy to TJ about to fail an exam. <laughs> but you must have some difficult moments at school, TJ. You talk about when you're friends with faith. How has the gospel helped? It's true. Um, I think that the biggest thing has been for me that I've earned a lot of awards that I, mm -hmm. that I shouldn't have. Like, okay, let me not say that I shouldn't have, but that I know that in and of myself, mm -hmm. there's no way. You know, when I finished my exams last semester I, and I saw my grades, I told people that Jesus wrote my exams and then God corrected them. Because there's <laughs> no way that the grades that I got could have helped. But I know that even I when I'm... Are not watching. <laughs> <laughs> even when, you know, I'm going through struggling, I know that at the end I'm going to have a Bachelor of Arts in Linguistics and I'm going to be the holder of a degree and that all the hard work that I put in. And I think that we have to look at salvation and our Christian walk is the same way, that we go through a lot of battles. But if we just stick it out, if we just stay on the path, then at the end, heaven. The best is yet to come. Yes, yeah. so true. Um, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. For me, what jumped toe at me for the, was that they used feet um, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. Feet, normally feet don't just stay there you move mm. around so mm. it's like you have the gospel of peace so you got you can't be still with it it's like you have this good news mm -hmm. so witnessing comes about there and mm -hmm. the more you witness the more it helps you because it's like as you're trying to help someone you help yourself you you actually see how sin actually damages us and then in that way it should be able to help you to even keep more firmer mm -hmm. because you already know where you have been and you already see where people are in the darkness and you know you're in the light so it should even help you more so to want to keep close to Jesus. So you're saying to viewers and young people who have or think they have better things to do on Sabbath afternoon or even a Sunday evening than to go out and talk to somebody about Bible that it helps uh, your Christian experience? Yes, yeah. I would advertise for your anytime. You would? Oh. Yeah. But is that true? Does it really help? Uh, yes, because I think it, the mere mm -hmm. fact you have to go and speak to people regarding Jesus, it helps to encourage you to study more because when they start asking questions, mm -hmm. you should be able to answer. So it helps you to, to study, to know as a Seventh-day Adventist, what are we about? What do we believe? So that if and someone comes up to us and asks us, and ask us a question. Mm -hmm. We can answer them, answer them, not um, confidently. Yes, right, confidently. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, though, it depends um, on your style because I, not everybody's going to be like, you know, here. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm here to share the word of God with you. Mm -hmm. I personally don't see it that way. My mm -hmm. way of, of of witnessing to somebody is actually through Facebook. I talked to. I remember I had a conversation with a friend of mine, a really close friend of mine. And we were talking about the Sabbath mm. and Ten Commandments and different things on Facebook chat. Mm -hmm. And we just use our Bibles and things, but we were witnessing to each other. And um, I find it depends on the medium and the style in which you do it. Yeah. But you're still talking. But you're still you're talking. Still, yeah. You're yeah. still, still, you're still moving. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. But it just, you know. It's true. 
Go ahead, TJ, because he, Dominique is going to um, keep teasing me to say some stuff and all and big up in some things that he's saying. So you speak, please. Well, I was just going to say we have a message on Facebook, <coughs> and um, this person, Claire, she was saying that um, the peace that we have in the warfare is that even though there's a spiritual battle between good and evil over our lives, the peace we have is that we were promised in the word that the battle's already won. So this is just assurance that gives us great peace in the center of this war. Wonderful. And I think that you, when you can, like Dominic does, when you can talk to people about it, like all three of you guys were saying, it's important to share. When you share, and when people see that in the middle of all your storms, you're peaceful, that is a huge witness as well. A, a, a big thing too of your peace is your praise. How much you praise God. Not saying that you have to be all up, you know, when church is going, you know you got to be this, you know, falling up before God and trembling and all that there. It's how much people can see you praising God despite. Like, if, if this simply ask you a question, how are you doing? I'm abiding. I'm trusting. Mm -hmm. I know God has it for me. Things ain't looking too pretty now, but I know He's working out for my favor. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, a real good sign of that peace that passes oh. all understanding. But even before we go, to, I just want to say something that relates to what that means. I will leave it alone. Um, I, I do understand there are many different ways for us to spread the gospel, to tell us about Christ and so on. But I also believe that we, we do have this where a corporate responsibility comes in. Because sometimes we always hide under, under the, the, the umbrella of there's a different way of doing things. And sometimes we don't do anything at all. But to me, even if you're not a talker, you can go with somebody who is. And you can learn from that. You can see, you know, on the, on the road for a sign. So to my mind, when you have Christ in your heart, you want to share him in whatever way you can. Whether it's going house to house, whether it's on the internet, whether it's sending the text, whatever. Because you have the gospel, you have the truth, you, you want to live it, you want to tell it, you want to jump. You go wherever the peace will lead you. Yeah. If I could add to what you're saying. Quickly, because we've got to wrap up this session here. Okay. Um, with, the, with going out, you need the support. You don't go and fight a one-man army. It's, it's an army, so it, it's a support. So just do it even if just for the support. Yeah. Okay. True. Understood. So we're going to take a quick break. But again, we're going to remind you that you can find us on Facebook. Thank you to Claire for your um, message on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us. So tweet us, Facebook us. I think Facebook is a verb now. Yeah. Facebook <laughs> us, Skype us, and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. So let's look at this subject. I'm going to tell you why I'm disgusted. So tonight, looks like sex will be our topic of discussion. Now see, sex isn't evil, for marriage is why God made it. But I know you're like, come on, man, that's too outdated. This is 2011, bro. We do it for recreation. And hey, if you're in college, you do it while you're wasted. But I want to question this logic. I want to pop off the seal. I want to question something that we think is already a done deal. So think of rape victim, for example. And once it's revealed, when her bruises go away, is she totally healed? Nah, the damage is lasting. You can see it in her eyes. But if it was just abuse recreation, why did it ruin her life? I mean, if sex is just for fun, why does it take such a toll? Maybe it's because you don't just have sex with a body, you have sex with a soul. Which means for me, there ain't no premarital loving. <laughs> and it ain't just because I want a baby in the oven, it's because I'm staying pure till the day that I'm a husband. But see, this wasn't always me. That's a guarantee. Let's go back in the past, see who I used to be. Now growing up, I never learned how to treat a lady. If I learned one thing from my dad, it was leave the mom, ditch the baby. Now I don't say that to get sympathy, I say that to be real. Because according to stats, about 40% of you know how that feels. So I let the TV show me what the music already told me. No dad at home, so I was letting MTV mold me. And they sold me, which is why my life revolved around what girl I could get next. My life revolved around this girl named Sex. Shoot, I'd get at her on the text, but I gotta confess. It seems the longer we dated, the bigger the mess. But then, my girlfriend was late on that time of the month. If you know what I mean, you understand when I say my heart sunk. I started to think about abortion, man. I started to butter it up. But it's funny, they don't make condoms for sin. You can't just cover it up. It was just a scare, but I knew a father I didn't want to be. <laughs> it's funny how I was pro-life until it happened to me. So dudes think twice before you desire her just because she's hot. Because the truth is, your body makes a promise whether you do or not. 
Sorry I digress, though. Let's get back to the topic. How there's some dudes who pressure her even when she says stop it. You're not a man. You're just a boy that can shave and you put on a good cover. Because if you don't respect her when she says no, you certainly don't love her. So how about you start studying her heart, stop studying her booty, or maybe invest the same amount of time in her that you do in Call of Duty. Because what makes you think you can get this girl and all of a sudden get naughty? Because you should have to touch her heart and her mind first before you ever touch her body. Because she longs to be accepted, she longs to be loved, so she gives herself up to another guy's lust. She thinks it feels good at first, but then she gets bitter. Because the promise of satisfaction, it never delivers. She's like, I don't want to, but it's just too tempting. So she keeps opening up the present just to find that it's empty. And then she starts to get confused. She keeps getting rejected by all these dudes. They tell her on a scale of 10, she's a two. But that ain't true. If she only knew that Jesus, he loves and accepts us. Even when you don't want him, he'll never reject us. He heals us from that sin that totally infects us. And he does what condoms can't, he emotionally protects us. And I know some of you hear this, you're gonna want to indict me. But we gotta think rightly, so I'll ask politely. Can you really say this isn't even true, just slightly? I mean, we touched the forbidden fruit, not to realize it's poison ivy, and now we're numb and we're itching, and we got a distorted psyche. You don't think you just do it, like your name was Nike, not realizing that the consequences of your actions are oh, so pricey. So this last story, though, is for those who think they're too dirty. This last story is for those who think they're unworthy. Read John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. The religious leaders throw her naked in the temple while she yells, don't murder me. They say, Jesus, the law commands us to stone this woman. And you hear the hate in their tone. Jesus pauses it and says, whoever's without sin, you can cast the first stone. I mean, can you imagine the sound? Silence all around. You hear footsteps walk away. You hear stones hit the ground. And then Jesus kneels down. The woman thought it was her demise. He lifts up her face. You see the grace in his eyes. He says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. I love you. I accept you. Mercy is yours. But if you're anything like me, you're like, no, that can't be. Why would he ever die for me? See, but then I saw that scene where I was redeemed. He reached out and touched me and said, Jeff, you're free. Instantly, I was wearing the brightest robe I'd ever seen. I was perfectly spotless. I was perfectly clean. So bright, in fact, man, I thought I'd go blind. I said, whose is this? He said, actually, it's mine. So think twice before you eat what society feeds us. Come follow the king. His name is Jesus. Hi, good evening. Welcome back to the God Stop, where we're discussing how to arm ourselves for victory as Christians. We've, also, we've already discussed Sorry, um, the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. And now we're going to talk about the shield of faith. And Paul, speaking about the shield of faith, says that when we use it, we will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. What does this text mean to you? I know that you, Dominic, were talking earlier about how um, Paul was talking about how the darts are, are fiery. Let's yeah. talk about that. Well, Les was basically saying, like, the shield back in that day was measuring about four, four feet by two and a half inches, two and a half feet, sorry. And uh, consists of two layers of wood glued together, and the, apparently the arrows used to be dipped in pitch, I would, I would set, uh, they were lit with fire, and then they would, you know, they would do, um, attack the, the other people with them. Um, the Bible talks about, yes, the devil, throws these wells, th these arrows at us constantly, these fiery arrows, you know. And, you know, we always have to be shooting ourselves with faith, shooting ourselves with faith. These, these arrows can include things like doubt, you know, you know, discouragement, you know, not believing that God has a plan for your life and that kind of thing. And you have to be constantly shielding it and buffering that, you know. Because if you don't shield it, let, let's say, for instance, if you don't use your shield, it will attack the righteousness, your best plate. I looked at it from that perspective, so I was saying to myself, the faith is so important because it covers, it actually is the shield of the breastplate as well, and the body of, it, of itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, very important for that matter. Faith with all the cares of this world, every time we look around, something is wrong, something yep. is hurting someone. If we don't have the faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. it's easy to crash and to say, well, it doesn't make sense anymore. Why am I doing this? But if we have faith 
in Jesus and faith that the battle is already won. We can go on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can be strong mm-hmm. because we know that the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. Yeah. Wonderful. You could almost tell you to preach the word. <laughs> <laughs> the word. Great. Well, for me, um, I was looking at it that nothing can happen without faith. Because you know it says without faith it is impossible to please God. And when you look at Abraham, or Abraham mm. he was counted as a favorite of God, so to speak, because of his faith. So faith is very important. It's what we have that helps us to do all the other things. We put on the armor of God in faith because we believe that God will protect us from the devil. So that's how I see that one. But I, I think, though, as the Lysa pointed out, the faith isn't just you know, theory, it's practical. Yeah. And just the doctrine. And I mean, honest, a lot of us as Adventists, we real good when it comes to talking about faith, all the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. But when we're in Trinity, how much of us really sit down and claim that God is going to do what He said He would do? A lot of us doubt God. That's why I, I think it goes back to the lesson from last week. We were talking about miracles happening. I think we lack that faith, that practical faith that's, that actually sticks to what God says and believes it and not just believes it but moves forward you know moves forward in that faith that it will happen you know so the helmet not the helmet of faith sorry the shield of faith is necessary for us and kind of summing up what you guys said it's necessary because we have to know that despite the darts the fiery darts of the devil that at the end of the day we will have salvation which leads us into the Oh, yeah, and even uh, uh, just say a little word on the idea of faith before you go into that, and even jumping back to the previous lesson and so on. My concept of faith, I, I, I like to look at it the way in terms of quenching the darts, as I think Lisa would have alluded to it. We don't always get away scotch free in this life. That's true. We don't always get away scotch free. Things happen, and we often say life happens. Sometimes Things go bad horrible but knowing and trusting God and believing in him faith somehow quenches that pain it it eases it you're you're in pain but you feel a little better because you can see the outcome you understand when revelation I mean when revelation talks about and I John saw new Jerusalem coming down from heaven prepared I mean you understand when the Bible says there be no like that song says no more no more crying yeah. no more tears you know something you you understand that and and that gives you hope to hold on and to believe that God will see you through whatever difficulty you're going on I mean that is marvelous and to me that is the devil can throw whatever he likes at you he can have you pinned down at times but faith just quenches that yeah. shakes that off it's like you in a, a boxing ring and you're against the devil mm-hmm. and then as, as, as somebody pointed out already you really can't fight the devil on your own you know you have to get to the point where you realize you put up the gloves and say you know what Th- this bad ain't for me devil I hear you knocking but you can't come in not today not today mm-hmm. you have that faith that when faith answers that door and fear knocks at it that fear has to go away all the doubts all the different fears that you may have the insecurities that you may be struggling with they have to fall short because of the faith that you have in God. Mm. So true. Yeah, I, I think faith is very important. Just a quick aside, we're actually going to go um, another 15 minutes due to the technical issues that we had before. So, yay, more time. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Pastor. <laughs> now, we're talking about the, the, the helmet of salvation. And as noted in the, in, the, in the lesson, all the other parts are put on by the individual. But this one part is handed to or put on by somebody else. The helmet of salvation. What, what is the significance of that? The helmet of salvation being placed on the soldier other than the soldier being placing it on himself. What, what's the significance of that? Kimberly? <laughs> well, um, what I would say with the helmet, mm-hmm. as it was actually seen in the lesson as well, it's based on what God gives you. Is is nothing that you can do for yourself. So this is something that God has to give you. Is is nothing that you can claim for yourself. It's nothing that you can boast about. Salvation. Hey, it puts on this helmet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is the salvation that comes from God. Yeah. We are saved 
from God and not through anything that we can do of ourselves. And the funny thing is, I don't. I, I, I would even go further and say, God cannot help us to put on that. We have to make that decision to accept the salvation. Mm. You know, we can't say, okay, God, um, adjust it here for me. I take. We have to make a decision to once we make that first step to put it on, he would do everything else. Mm -hmm. But we have to make that independent decision to take it up, claim it, receive it, and put it on. And that, that, that leads that me to the, that leads me to the, to the concept. And I like the analogy Paul is using. I mean, Paul had indeed to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When you're talking about the whole idea of helmet of salvation, you're using salvation uh, for the piece of equipment that goes on the, on the head. Mm -hmm the mind. Salvation is a mental choice. Mm. Salvation doesn't fall in the lap of anybody. It's not anything about predestination. It's a mental choice. And that's why he used the helmet of salvation. I'm saying all of us, we have to choose Christ for ourselves. It is our mind that have to make that decision. Yeah. God can't make that decision for us. We've got to make it ourselves. God will do all he can to save us. Christ died on the cross to save us. But if we don't accept it mentally, yeah. you can't just follow the crowd now. We were talking earlier. You follow the crowd, but no, the helmet of salvation is an individual thing. There's no group helmet. You ever saw a group helmet? I've never <laughs> seen any. There's no group helmet. This is something you've got to do on your own. You've got to say, God, I want this. I'm accepting this. I'm taking this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. So yeah, because whether we want to believe mm -hmm. it or not, we are in a battle. And at the end of the day, we're either on the winning side or the losing side. So the, the choice is ours to make. Correct. And let me read this text quickly. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I like this, and we'll ask you a quick question. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This could be a very scary thing, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so what is this text really saying? No, no, wait, Dominic, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I want, I get Lisa first. <laughs> Come on, Dominic, Dominic, itching to speak on this one. But what is this text really saying? This could be scary stuff. Well, I believe that once we have, once we're equipped with, with the mm -hmm. Word of God, nothing can come in our way. Mm -hmm. Satan will throw whatever he has at us, but once we can stand firm with God's word, that's why we need to study to show ourselves the proof mm -hmm. that when these things come at us, we can say, well, you know what? God has already worked it out for me. Got you. Honestly, mm -hmm. Kimberly? Well, the whole way I look at it mm -hmm. is it's two-edged. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be to how you use it, mm -hmm. and then it can be how it's used but to you. So it's like Yes, it cuts. It can also cut you. It is supposed to cut you because none of us are without sin. All of us have sin. Mm -hmm. So the way how some people will use it, you know, you hear a sword, so you're just studying about attacking, Stop attacking. It, it mm -hmm. actually can cut you. Mm -hmm. And how I also see it is um, when we speak, when we say things, when we respond to questions or to even accusations, it should come from Scripture. We we also we always say we must emulate Jesus. Whenever mm -hmm. Jesus had to respond to anything, it came from came scripture. scripture. And mm -hmm. anything that he said it was used for the saving of souls. Honestly, wonderful. Dominique, quickly, quick, 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 quick. I I always used to say, in my opinion, it meant piercing but yet healing at the same time. Mm. Restoring at the same time. Mm taking away the things that are not supposed to be there in your life, mm. but yet restoring the things that are to be there in your life, mm. that God wants you to, 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 to have and to use. Mm. Now, this word, we not only use it for others, I think we should use it for our own selves, because it's the end of the lesson it says that this word mm. is the Spirit, mm. the Holy Spirit, you know, and, um, and how, how He guides us, and, 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 and really dividing the word of truth, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I think, though, that it is important that we understand that we use this word not to necessarily judge somebody, mm -hmm. but to help them at the end of the day. Got you. But watch this and, and quickly. I like the last part of it. That's why I say it can be scary, mm -hmm. because it talks about discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
So the God knows when we're faking. Yeah. Huh? He knows when you put in it on, man. He knows when you when you when you just want people to think you're spiritual and you're just walking around the place and puffing up your chest and quoting oh, scripture boy. and the scripture you you recited in your head early in the morning. So you know when you get in the crowd, you can recite that scripture. God knows when you're faking. But well, you know it as well. Huh? You know it. As yeah, well. you know it. Mm. But the most important is that God knows. Mm -hmm. And when you think you're fooling the crowd. God knows. It's important that we don't need to fake because God is the one who wants to save us and He's doing His best to save us. You know what I'm so we don't need to fake it. Yeah. But what is, this is my question. What is the point of faking something that came into your life in a genuine way? What do you say it's doing? To me, it seems like a like a, I don't know, what we call it, oxymoron. Well, TG like would tell you. An anomaly. An anomaly. anomaly. You it doesn't make sense right? because uh, you could, I, I, I personally think mm -hmm. that if you are faking it, then you have not been genuine. You have not been genuinely converted, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. You have not had that real experience of Christ. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't see the need of faking something that mm -hmm. came into you in a genuine way. So you want to show happen. off. Hmm? You want yeah. to show off. You want to make it seem that you have more than you might actually have. Uh, hmm. If I could throw a question. Well, you have to throw it quickly, and they say, <laughs> I'm going to cut you because we're going to wrap up this session. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you're talking about faking it. You know, normally you have the, the term fake it until you make it. You have uh, people coming up in church, but they may not have had the conversion, mm -hmm. but yet they know it's a place to be. Mm -hmm. would, would you then consider that they are not being genuine, that they are faking it? Well, we respond to that when we come back from our break. Yeah. Right. So we're going to take a quick break. Um, we're just reminding you of the social media, Skype, Twitter, and Facebook. We will be right back. Good evening, welcome back to The God Stop, where we're discussing arming ourselves um, in the battle against 
spiritual forces. And we were just discussing the sword. And I think one of the really important things that we need to remember about the sword is that when we look at the belt of truth and the shoes of the gospel and the helmet of salvation and the other aspects of the armor, they're all for um, offense. They're all for shielding blows or to make sure that we're safe and we're protected. But the sword is specifically, not only is it is mentioned last by Paul, but it's specifically the only part of the armor that deals with offense. And I think that we need to take an example defense. from defense. Sorry, <laughs> thank you, Dominic. That is the only part that deals with defense. And I think we need to take an example from Jesus' life and see that the sword is what we can actively use against the devil when he comes and he tries his tricks. We have to actively quote scripture and make sure that we use that, it's like jabbing him. You can't get me, Satan, because I have the sword. <laughs> so I think, I think, we, I know that's kind of a weird way to put it, but I think that that is. We need to remember that as well. And before we get our final comments from our guests as we wrap up our session this evening, as Kimberly would have asked quickly and I try to respond as quick as I can, there's some persons who are genuinely not necessarily faking a situation, but they, they're trying to feel it and they're not feeling it. And all I say to an individual is to know it is to feel it. I mean, you've got to read and study for yourself. It takes that effort. I mean, it will not happen overnight. You, you don't always have to, want, have to feel a particular way to be one with God. You just have to know His Word and follow His Word and live daily a life that pleases Him. And He will lead us all in the direction that we need to go. So yes, there may be those, you're not necessarily faking it, but you're really trying, but you're not feeling it. But I say, to, as I said, to know it is to feel it. So it takes a few comments from our guests, um, short comments as we try to wrap up our session tonight. Mm -hmm. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> Well, the only thing that I would want to leave is uh, Romans 8. Well, let me go from 38, 39. Well, the question was asked before, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Mm -hmm. And Paul is saying that he's persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So as we're talking about the armor, know that as God asks us to put the armor on, he's not leaving us defenseless against the words of the devil, against anything that he may throw, throw at us. He wants us to be saved in his kingdom. And give one short encouraging word to the youth as well as you give your closing comment. So your short encouraging word to the youth. I would encourage the youth to keep on the winning side. If you want to look at it that way, the Lord is the winning side, keep on the winning side. Wonderful. Dominic? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Um, it's important that we, as Christians, yes, we, we um, are, as the Bible says, we are in the world, but not of the world. But it's still important that we still watch what is going around around us and still be constantly communicating with God, still praying, still asking Him for His guidance so that we can travail and so we can just just get through every day victorious in Christ. Any particularly encouraging word for the youth? Um, I would say for all the young people out there, um, don't give up. Don't give up. It, 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 it's really hard now because as, as I was talking to a friend of mine this evening, they were saying, you know, this generation has more distractions and more things to deal with that than any other generation before. But I, 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 I was thinking, you know what? In spite of the fact that we may have a lot of different issues surrounding mm -hmm. us, I think. Don't give up. Don't give up. Trust God. Wonderful. Lisa? Okay, I just want to say that by putting on all of God's armor, we can be assured that the devil is going to lose. Jesus has already won the battle. We just need to claim the victory. And the only way to stand is on our knees with lifted hands. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Nice, nice. I like it. TJ, your closing thought. Oh, well, um, I, I would just like to say, like, you have to make sure that you have every bit of the armor on. Walk in the Word. Make sure that you are trying your best to, to, to live in the way that you should. And remember that you're only going to be young for so long. And the, the things that we have to face, academics, boyfriend, girlfriend situations, friends, whatever the case may be, they won't last forever. And if you stick with God, 
just just stick with God. I'm working on that too. I'm working on that, sticking with God. In the end, heaven. Hello, heaven. Amen. <laughs> well, what we want to encourage all of our viewers and ourselves is understanding the importance of arming for victory. It is real. Christianity is real. We are not up here to fake a situation or to put on an act that is not real. But we too go through our struggles and we have our challenges. But we've seen time and time again how God will have come through for us. And we are saying to you out there that God can also come through for you. And the concept of having a breastplate of, of, of righteousness and having that shield of faith, it is real. Sometimes we don't understand, sometimes I don't understand situations, but as I trust God and watch things unfold, I see Him working things out in my life. And I'm saying today, the same God I serve is the same God who can do so many wonderful things for all of you out there. This thing is real. I mean, studying the Bible, studying this week's lesson came through to me as marvelous, and I believe it can come true to you just as marvelous. And I'm saying the only way, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And as you try God, you will see how good He tastes. And all of those who are sitting here tonight can tell you that God tastes wonderful. And you can't get enough of Him. You can't exhaust Him. You can't eat all of Him. Trust me. I'm saying to all of you who are viewing, Remember that God is a wonderful God. He's a real God and all of your situations are real. How you feel is real. And I know a God who knows how to make you feel better. Trust Him, serve Him. And at the end of the day, you will be better for it. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for stopping at the God Stop where we would have really stopped and listened to God and helped Him to take us where He wants us to go. We are hoping that you can join us again as we can come, come next Friday to discuss another lesson. Those of you on Skype, Weekend Radio, Facebook, Twitter, Keep joining us. Keep sending your comments. Keep joining with us as we spread the gospel of salvation. I'm Pastor Jason Reed. I'm Tershatha Jeffrey. Thank you so much for joining us on The God Stop, where we stop and wait for God to take us wherever we need to go. Have a good night. Over and out. <laughs>